Um, my name is Owen Morrissey. I'm principal here in Golden National School. Um, and this year, 2012-2013, um, the school are celebrating 75 years um, since the current school building was built here on site. Um, the folklore uh, collection that we're trying to compile at the moment um, was compiled mainly by the students at the school. Um, however, a number of um, local people weren't too happy to, to come on camera um, and I had the pleasure of meeting some of those and getting some of their recollections of Golden um, when compiling the book Golden Days, which is a, a book on the history of the National School here. Um, we we compiled um, a couple of memoirs from people and we received others from deceased members of the community um, and obviously their memories are very valuable and I'm just going to take this opportunity to, to bring some of them to you. One particular man um, is Tom Dunphy, he's a native of Sardin's Lot where he currently resides just um, on the Cashin Road out of the village of Golden and uh, he brought his memories of school um, to us when we were doing the book. Um, he started in the old school in, in Atasal Abbey, um, which is just about a mile from the village of Golden, in 1935. And he attended that school for a couple of years before moving to the, the parish hall, which is now demolished, but was close to the, the main entrance of the church, um, where he, he attended school there for maybe a year and a half. And from then he remembers moving up into the current school building um, here on site uh, in 1937, November 1937. Um, he talks, uh, he, met, he spoke about his days in the, the old school and how Mr. Maguire was there, Master Maguire as he called him, um, uh, coming up into the upstairs classroom, which was the, the classroom for the younger, the younger kids in the school. And um, the school was in such a state at the time that he remembers the master looking down through the floorboards at the older kids and if any of them were caught missing or out of check um, they obviously received the, the punishment suitable to the crime. Um, it was an old two, two room building, obviously one, one classroom above the other and um, they had no problem with um, frost and things like that back in, in, in Tom's time in, in National School because there were no toilets, no running water, no heating systems, so frost didn't cause the same problems back then as it did, as it does today. Um, he also describes the, the school and the, the fairly basic nature of, of the furniture in the classrooms, just two firms, a couple of desks and so on. And he talks about how the kids had to go for a bucket of water. And if you wanted to get a drink during class time, there was a, there was a nail, um, in a tree, with a with a cup hanging off hanging off it, you got the cup, dipped it into the bucket, and got your drink. And everyone drank from the same cup and the same bucket. No washing of hands, nothing like that. It was, it was fairly primitive. Um, and he he spoke about their playground was the road. There was no difficulty with the people kids playing on the road. Um, the roads were fairly quiet. You can only remember a few people at that time back in the in the mid thirties. With a car, he spoke about a man called Mr. Harris, who was a vet in the area. He had a car. There was Charlie Hogan, was a local hackney driver. He had a he had a a car. But other than that, cars were fair, were few and far between. Um. He he has a special link with the school, I suppose, because the stone that was used to build the current school building here uh, in Golden in nineteen thirty seven was drawn from a pit in Tom's own farm um, and I suppose one thing one one memory he brings was that the the pony that the Malumbi who was the man who built the school the, the pony that he used to draw the draw the gravel and the stone from the pit was um, it dropped dead below in the pit so he that was his memory of of um, the the school being built and he can remember then on the first day of the new school everyone attended in the hall as they had been doing for the year and a half previous to that and they just walked straight up he couldn't remember whether it was summer or winter but he kind of thought that it was probably winter and he was right it was actually November 1937 he thought it was probably winter because 
the two boys leading the group were carrying buckets of coal, which was obviously one of the reasons um, why he thought so. Um, he goes on, he gives some other memories of sport. Tom was very involved in the GAA. Um, he, he remembers Golden as the Golden Fontenoy's, even though he, he, he's fairly adamant that that was just um, a name that was given to the club. It wasn't an official name. It was more like a nickname that the club got. Um, and he also speaks, uh, he, he recalls the schoolhouse um, on the church lane beside the old parish hall, between where the old parish hall was at the back of Liam Sullivan's, inside the main gates of the church. So at that time, the main gates of the church were closer to the church. And the schoolhouse then was, would, or the, the, the principal's residence would have been inside the current school, um, or the current church gates. Um, back to the G8, he talks, uh, I'll just read a little section from his memories here. It says, hurling was a big game at that time in the early, for, in the early um, 40s. Um, they played nearly every day, although if someone got a bad injury, Master Maguire would ban hurling for a while to teach everyone a lesson. There were no competitions for juveniles at that time. The first real match was at minor level, and Tom remembers winning a minor competition in about 1948. But as a young boy, he'd often play matches against the other side of the river, sometimes in O'Donnell's Field over in Thomastown, others down in Clawley. He can recall marking Tommy Quigley in one of those games, and can also remember a man by, my, by the name of Michael O'Donoghue, who now lives in Bursley, getting a right cut over his eye, and even still, if he was to meet Michael O'Donoghue, he'd look at him and he can see the mark on his eye. Um, he was ca he he remembers that he he had to be carried away in the in the Hackney um, owned by Charlie Hogan, and um, it was quite a, a story at the time because even though people were well used to getting cuts, they didn't. This seemed to be a little bit more serious than the norm. Um, they said they always made their own hurleys, um, and they were. He was very interested in in um, splicing hurleys something that have, has come back in more recent times, which was very, very popular back in his day. And he said it wouldn't always have been ash that was used for hurlies. Whatever you had, you'd use. Um, and he doesn't remember anyone playing football or music or singing at that time. Hurling was the only game that mattered. 